So the overview of what I'm going to be speaking about touches on precision age management. And I specifically add that word, and you, you saw in Steve's talk, personalization of medicine, care, medical care, and how precision medicine is the future of medicine. Genetic scrutiny is part of it. I'm going to touch on some client cases, epigenetics and DNA, and how we can use them in the setting of practice, and then make some concluding comments. Okay. So in age management, we can use this approach because it makes it possible to potentially avoid premature disability and death, as well as hopefully do all the good things like improving energy levels, including sexual energy, lean muscle mass, bone density, cognitive function, um, and additionally improve Im immune system, which is probably fundamentally what causes a lot of us to go downhill um, as we age. And it may allow for prolonged disease-free life, which is really important. We see all these commercials about do we know that we're going to have enough money to live for as long as we want to live now that we live longer lives. But my question when I see these commercials is how do we know that we're going to have the health that we need to live these extended lives? So the, the thought that, um, that I live with in, in this field is how to attain optimal health for life. How do you maintain it? How do you identify your health assets and liabilities? How do you set up priorities for that? Can we establish a process for each person? How do we motivate and invest our patients to do so? And that it is an ongoing process. So I'm going to be touching on some of the leaders in the country in this field who we're going to hear more and more from. And some of you might know them personally. Others might be hearing about them for the first time. But across the country, there are different schools and universities that are now creating departments of personal medicine and genomics, precision medicine. So there's been a little bit of a battle. What it's, what it, what it's going to be called in the future is unclear to me. But essentially, it means the same thing. And there's departments at Stanford, Vanderbilt, Harvard. They're across the country. Is it in clinical practice yet? Not quite, because the thought is that the future will bring us all the technology we need to crunch the numbers, to look at lifestyle, to look at genetics, and everything in between, and make these decisions. Well, in fact, what most of the country doesn't know is that we in age management are already doing just that. We do it somewhat crudely, because after all, we're, we come out of an era, and we're still living in the era of evidence-based medicine. But evidence-based medicine is about regression to the mean. It's about doing studies that basically look at groups. But if you look at what groups are, you might not be part of that group. The group is a, a range. It's like a normal bell-shaped curve. And most studies look at the mean, the peak of that curve. It doesn't look at the minus three standard deviations or the plus three standard deviations. And therefore, when you apply these rules, as we do in conventional medicine, you're really applying rules to somebody where the rules might not fit. And if you then take it one step further and you look at these rules and you've done these studies in a group of Caucasians who live in Boston and you try to apply it to Asians who live in um, California, the rules may, ha may have to be thrown out altogether. So the notion that we can just broadly apply rules in evidence-based medicine and come up with these guidelines makes no sense and have never made sense in a way if you think about it. But it does give us a structure. It's that structure that's going to be totally destroyed in the next decade or two as genomics becomes real to the rest of the country. So this is a Dr. Uh, Bowser at Vanderbilt in, in his own words. After having gone through a period where blockbuster drugs and massive screening were the norm, we're actually moving back to a place where we're trying to tailor care to the individual. And this can be done, too. There are, there are lots of labs out there that are beginning to arise. There's one that's available and covered by insurance called Uscript, where you can actually take samples, and this is buccal smears, so you just use saliva. You send it in, and you can actually tell if um, your patient needs more or less of certain drugs, and they can look at the combination of medications, even supplements, to see whether or not somebody is actually going to be sensitive to something or need twice or three times the dose. So we have found this to be very useful, and I'm sure you, like, like us, know that there are patients who come in and say, I'm exquisitely sensitive, I just need a fraction of a dose, and others who say, that, that dose doesn't even touch me, I need ten times that amount. 
Uh, now, at UCSF, there was a conference that actually, a summit that happened last year where they pulled together 150 folks, um, including Zuckerberg from Facebook and Francis Collins from NIH, and they looked at this field and what it might look like in the future, and this emerging field as they defined it, of precision medicine, aims to harness the vast advances in technology, genetics, and biomedical research to better understand the roots of disease and to transfer health care so that prevention, diagnosis, and treatment are precisely tailored to the individual, to develop targeted therapies, and to improve care to patients worldwide. So how do I think of patients? Well, I don't think of them as patients. I actually think of them as clients, but I would have my head handed to me if I called them clients at Yale or any other university or hospital in a way, and certainly would never think of them as customers, and I still don't. But I don't think of them as patients because I don't think of them as sick, although they're not necessarily healthy. The disease has just not yet emerged. If you think about it, you can detect signs and symptoms decades before diabetes actually shows up. It's just a matter of looking for what are the risk factors. You know, Cesare told us this morning, you have to look at the family history, you have to go back to your roots, you have to ask questions, and you have to get the detail. And as I like to think of it, the family history is a poor man's genetic test. If you know that you take after members of the family, not just in the way you look, you know that the insides might also, if you're growing up and you're developing that pot belly just like Uncle Fred, well, you can ask your patient, did Uncle Fred have diabetes? Was he taking a lot of meds as he got older? And you can be sure that your patient is going down that same route as well. Symptoms may not be present. They may be unrecognized, underdiagnosed, compensated, explained by aging or stress. This is the opportunity for the age management beyond hormonal optimization as personalized medicine evolves. You address all abnormalities and you address clinical findings as soon as possible. It's not unusual, for example, and I would say in about 15 to 20 percent of patients, we find diseases that are curable because you find them so early. Leukemia, prostate cancer, lung cancer, heart disease. Um, there are patients who wouldn't have gone through any kind of detection and for years, if not decades, and because they elected to go through a workup, their lives were basically saved. 